First of all, welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you here. Um, we are gonna be talking about pandemics and single payer, COVID-19's case for Medicare for All. Uh, we're joined by some amazing panelists today. We will have more of an answer to them in a little bit. We've got um, Amy Garland, Paul Song, and uh, Sanjeev Sriram. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Just as a brief overview, we'll do a quick intro to single payer during the COVID-19 era, and then we'll have um, our panel answer some questions, and we'll leave lots of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Bradley. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a second year student at the joint medical program between UCSF and UC Berkeley. And I'll be giving just a quick intro to what single payer is and sort of the conversation for today. And I can introduce myself as well while we're here. Um, I'm Nate Bo Levine. I'm a first year student in the JMP and I'll be moderating the panel after Bradley goes over the brief introduction. And yeah, both Bradley and I are members of Students for a National Health Program, uh, or SNAP, where we are advocating for single-payer healthcare in the US. Great. Uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded, uh, so we're going to uh, hopefully be sharing this out afterwards. And uh, here we go. So first, let's talk a little bit about the current healthcare system we have in the US. Uh, we have a very fragmented system as a mixture of public and private insurance with thousands of different plans and networks. Uh, this results in extreme administrative waste. And uh, just fundamentally, private insurance prioritizes profit over patients. Uh, their bottom line is to make money for their boards and their shareholders and not fundamentally to provide healthcare. Uh, in the US, if you have insurance or not, it's incredibly expensive to access care. Um, all of these things contribute to an overall decrease in life expectancy, increases in infant and maternal mortality, poor outcomes in many health metrics. Um, our system is more expensive than any country with universal health care, uh, and this is mostly due to administrative waste. We have hundreds of thousands of people who go bankrupt every year as a result of medical debt, and the vast majority of these folks are people who had health insurance when receiving their bankrupting care. Um, so even folks who do have um, insurance, folks are still suffering. Um, in a recent survey, 50% of folks with insurance reported delaying care uh, and a third not taking their medications as directed because of the cost associated with it. Uh, this results in worsening outcomes, uh, worsening conditions, and overall poorer outcomes. Uh, medical bills in the United States are a staggering problem. So one in four adult Americans report difficulties with medical bills. 20% uh, of these folks are, are folks who have insurance. Um, and Almost 60% of Americans get their insurance through their employers, meaning if they lose their jobs, uh, they lose their health insurance. So even with the gains of the Affordable Care Act, 10% of Americans still remain uninsured. Uh, in this vein, insurance is seen as a benefit, not as a human right, and it's tied to many con contingencies, such as one's job, one's relationship status, or immigration status. Uh, so many common life changes we'll all face could result in you uh, losing your health insurance in the U.S. Um, seven days ago, uh, the news reported that 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment. This is a staggering, dramatic increase. And this only accounts for the type of workers in the U.S. who can apply for unemployment. Uh, these numbers are already a week old. I wasn't able to find the latest numbers, but you can infer where they're at. Um, our health in a pandemic requires us to think collectively and we shelter in place to protect each other and universal access to health care would help stop the flow of the contagion. But today, at the start of the month, April 1st, the millions of people who lost their jobs uh, last month likely lost their health insurance as well. Um, so how do we fix it? Um, today, we're here to talk about a single payer approach to universal health care. Uh, how it works is that folks pay taxes based on their ability to pay with additional taxes on high income earners and on Wall Street financial speculation. Patients would be able to see any provider they like. There would be no networks, no cost at point of service. Uh, high quality care would be provided to every person regardless of their income, immigration, employment, or marital status. Uh, the government would pay the hospitals and healthcare, uh, healthcare providers. They would be the single payer in a single payer system. Doctors and other providers would remain independent and privately operating, but the care would be publicly funded. Uh, this would be a step towards health justice and equity. Um, marginalized groups that have been historically excluded from care would be covered, 
And what we think, uh, and we think this is a necessary but insufficient step towards health equity and health justice. A single payer system would cover everyone, uh, and it, this would include their dental, vision, and mental health care and reproductive care. Uh, it would eliminate out of pocket costs and medical bankruptcy. And it would do all of this at a cost savings to taxpayers by eliminating all of the administrative inefficiencies from our current fragmented system. Uh, and it would also give us this single payer bargaining power against our pharmaceutical companies. So that's a vision of where we could go, but um, we can already see consequences of COVID and lack of coverage. Uh, for instance, here recently in the news, uh, somebody uh, without insurance had a hospital bill of $34,000. Um, and we have 80 million Americans who are under uh, or uninsured. Um, so we see these impossible bills being foisted upon folks, and if you're sick and underinsured, are you going to go to the hospital to try to get healthier, or are you going to try to fight it out on your own uh, as long as you can, which is an unfortunate scenario which would possibly put you in a position to spread your infection to others. Um, other horror stories coming out of the news, we had a teen uh, who died of COVID-19. He was denied uh, treatment because he didn't have health insurance. And uh, we see folks who don't have insurance not getting tested and not getting treated, potentially spreading the virus to those around them. Uh, the US system is not set up to treat everyone, um, even in a pandemic. And so a single payer healthcare provides uh, a given nation with a unified health system, which would be able to coordinate uh, quick and effective care. A uh, single payer alone cannot adequately control an outbreak, but an outbreak can't really well be controlled without it. Um, other social protections are really important too here. Um, and also interesting note, uh, uh, some stats coming out about um, different folks from different ideological backgrounds embracing Medicare for all. The three panelists we have today are all physicians and all great advocates um, for single payer healthcare, for Medicare for all. And we're just really excited to kind of ask them a lot of questions and hear what they have to say and have an interesting conversation. And then I think maybe the last 10 minutes or so, we'll open it up for um, a Q&A with people who are here. So let me introduce uh, our panelists. So first off, we have Dr. Amy Garlin. She is uh, our Associate Program Director at the JMP, and she is an infectious disease specialist to boot. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Paul Song. He is a radiation oncologist, and he's also the President of Physicians for National Health Program. Uh, the California branch. And then lastly, we have Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. Uh, he's a pediatrician and he's also the founder of All Means All, which is a campaign to make sure that racial equity is a cornerstone of Medicare for All. So I guess just to start things off, I'd love for the three of you to kind of tell us a bit more about uh, your work, what you do, and sort of now what your day-to-day -day kind of looks like during the pandemic in terms of your clinical work and your advocacy, et cetera. And then maybe we can start with you, Dr. Garland. Sure. Um, thanks for the introduction, Nate, and thanks everyone for being here. And again, I'm sorry that that happened. Um, um, so I am an infectious disease specialist, as you said. I'm also an HIV primary care provider. That's the bulk of my practice here in Oakland, California. I take care of people with HIV. I also do some general infectious disease consultation in our community hospitals here. Um, and um, we, my, the population I take care of really spans the pretty much the entire spectrum um, socioeconomically and in terms of insurance status and is very diverse in most other ways as well with the exception that I don't see children. Um, our practice does serve some adolescents but um, we're, a, we're an adult practice. Um, we do take care of pregnant um, women and we care, take care of people through up through the advanced ages um, so really the whole the whole life cycle with the exception of children. And we started seeing people with symptoms that could have been COVID-19 probably in the middle of February, maybe even early February, looking back on it. Um, but at the time, we had no access to any testing at all. And that really limited our ability to um, 
to uh, steer them towards appropriate care and also towards appropriate measures for infection control. And so that really defined our, our experience in the early part of this pandemic. Um, more recently, we've seen patients in our practice who are symptomatic and some of whom have become seriously ill and we're taking care of them in the clinic and in the hospital. We've transitioned routine patient care to mostly telemedicine, but we are still seeing some urgent um, care that can be done uh, safely in the clinic, in our clinic. Our practice has been completely transformed um, in the last month and that's disrupted the lives, not just of our patients um, and their routine care, but also of all of the employees in our practice. It's really been an unprecedented um, disruption in our workplace and for our, for our patients. I'm very worried about so many of my patients for so many reasons, not just those who are at higher risk for COVID-19 for a variety of reasons, their pre-existing conditions, the conditions of their lives. Um, many of my patients are, are unhoused. Um, um, but also about their routine care that is getting deferred or happening in ways that are not ideal because of the resource diversion that has been necessary because of the lack of planning in our non-healthcare system for this pandemic. Um, and a lot of those things do rest in the fact that we, we, we lack a coherent healthcare delivery system um, that that could have planned for a pandemic in a way that a market-based system um, was never going to. Um, so there's lots to worry about. Um, and, and I think there are providers in my clinic and in our hospital, hospital system who are staying patient-centered and doing the best they can to continue to pick care for our vulnerable populations through this crisis and keeping their eyes on the crisis that preceded this crisis in terms of lack of access to affordable and equitable healthcare, and that will still be there when this crisis is over. Um, so this is just a point in time, the crisis of the fact that we don't have a functioning equitable healthcare system preceded it, made it worse, and will still be there when this virus uh, runs its course whenever that will be. I'll stop there and let my esteemed co-panelists talk a little bit about their experiences. Thank you, Amy. Maybe we can go to you, Dr. Song. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for putting this together and inviting me to participate. And uh, to Amy, stay safe because you really are uh, on the front lines of this. I am um, a board certified radiation oncologist. Uh, I have not practiced full time in several years, um, but I do volunteer and work part time at a low income inner city hospital in Los Angeles, Dignity California Hospital, where I see primarily uninsured and Medi Cal patients. Uh, I am uh, do brachytherapy, which is basically implanting radioactive isotopes into tumors. Uh, it's not something that requires a day-to-day -day when I was doing standard conventional radiation. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of these patients who uh, have Medi-Cal or no insurance can't uh, be seen by a radiation oncologist who will do this procedure. So I've been doing that, although some of these have been canceled right now because of the uh, coronavirus uh, situation, particularly those with um, uh, lower, lower grade prostate cancers and such. Um, I, um, when I'm not doing that, majority of my focus is um, I co-founded a, uh, a biotech company that is doing innovative immunotherapy. And I guarantee that when uh, our treatment finally gets FDA approval. It'll be a fraction of the cost of the treatments that are out there. Um, uh, oddly enough, the company that I co-founded, uh, we initially founded it in South Korea, which has been uh, lauded as an example of how to handle this crisis compared to all of the other countries. And I just want to say one thing, because uh, Vice President 
Biden has disingenuously used um, Italy as an example of why a um, universal single payer system would not work. Uh, I would like to uh, point out Korea is also a single payer system where it did work. Uh, and we can get into more specifics about that later. Um, as, as Dr. Garland mentioned, I think this is going to expose really the gross inequality and inefficiencies of our system in ways that uh, we were just seeing glimpses of prior to this uh, epidemic. Uh, when you talk about the lack of hospital beds, all you need to do is look at all of the hospitals like Hanneman and, and others that have been closed strictly because they were treating uh, patients who were either uninsured or Medi-Cal patients and they couldn't afford to keep the hospitals open under a, a single payer system, hospitals like Hahnemann and others would be thriving and we would have more than enough beds. Uh, and then coupled with the fact that the private insurance industry is always trying to grossly limit the days of hospitalization, hospitals have lost the incentive to try to keep many beds open. If anything, they view an empty bed as almost like a hotel that doesn't have a room that's filled. Uh, so it's always been this need to keep things at capacity. And I think this is exposing that uh, even further. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at the demographics of people that are severely ill from the COVID-19 virus, uh, they are very different in a state like Louisiana versus they are elsewhere. And if you look at Louisiana, they're number one in terms of maternal mortality. They, uh, even though they recently with the new Democratic governor have expanded Medicaid, uh, the access to care for a lot of these people, there's a lot of obesity, uh, diabetes, um, you know, and other health problems that have not been uh, treated. And a lot of these patients don't have access to medications and such. So they're at a higher risk population to get this, this virus. And again, that's exposing sort of the longer term failures of our system. Um, we can definitely get into more specifics uh, of this, but uh, and I hope we do have a chance to talk specifically about what Korea did right and how their single payer system really came into making sure that this was done correctly, uh, rather than uh, believe the lies that President, uh, Vice President Biden have touted. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll stop as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, I hope to ask a question about you know how other countries have responded and sort of the idea of like whether you know how other single payer countries have responded to this crisis. Um, yeah, and Dr. Shiram. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you for inviting me to join everyone. Um, you know, as has been uh, already, I think, pretty well um, stated, you know, COVID-19 has laid bare the, the shames, the shams, the longstanding injustices of our profits before patient healthcare system. Um, and you know, as has been described before, it is uh, low-income workers and communities of color who will be um, hurt the most uh, by uh, COVID-19 and all of its um, side effects on our economy. So, you know, with all of that, now more than ever, we are seeing the urgency of Medicare for All. Um, my team and I at Social Security Work started the All Means All campaign because 59% of the uninsured are people of color. And so we need racial equity to be a cornerstone of Medicare for All. And to better bridge the gaps between pain and power, we are working with coalitions of amazing activists uh, from a really wide range of organizations. Uh, to you know, get the word out and kind of flip some of the scripts about Medicare for All so that racial equity is centered. And to do that, we have a couple of lanes. Um, first, and most obviously, we are pushing members of Congress and candidates uh, to be enthusiastic, vocal supporters of Medicare for All. Um, this past fall, we made fact sheets describing the number of uninsured in each state and how that injustice disproportionately hurts that state's communities of color. Uh, in February, we went further and made fact sheets for every single congressional district, including the number of uninsured per district juxtaposed against the state's racial disparities in coverage. Um, as an example, California has 2,723,000 people who are uninsured, 80% of whom are people of color. 
Um, California has been a majority minority state for a few years. Um, and they are, you know, actually far ahead of where the country will be um, in 2040. But to me, 2040 is too long of a wait to be thinking about this issue. It has to be thought of uh, more urgently than that. And California is a great example because 67% of California's population are people of color. Um, our fact sheets can be found at socialsecurityworks.org slash allmeansallcdreports. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about the campaign. We have some other uh, lines of work like doing teach-ins and helping communities of color um, have a greater sense of ownership and kinship with Medicare for All so that it feels like a more tangible reality in their, in their communities and in their world um, in ways that maybe previous uh, single-payer conversations have missed the mark. Um, but yeah, I mean, excited to, you know, be on this panel and to, you know, talk more um, and um, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Sriram. Yeah, I really agree with your sentiment about uh, making racial equity a cornerstone of this movement. Um, yeah, for, uh, our group at SNAP has definitely realized that the fight for single payer often is very siloed from other issues related to health justice when in fact it's like completely interrelated and intertwined. Um, so at the SNAP annual conference this year, we had um, Dr. Susan Rogers talk to us about history of racial justice and how having Medicare for all is kind of a necessary, but of course not sufficient step in the path towards um, racial equity and racial justice in this country. And um, in our group here at the JMP, we're trying to kind of have more coalitions with other groups to not be so um, siloed in this fight. So for example, like working with the White Coats for Black Lives group at the JMP, and we're still thinking of other um, ways to kind of fight this fight um, with different coalitions. So thank you all for those introductions. Um, I guess we'll start with kind of a broad question, seeing as we only really have a few minutes, um, but um, we can also try to get more narrow as we, um, we have time. So basically, um, I think we can all agree that, you know, if we snapped our fingers and automatically had single payer healthcare in this country, it's not as if we'd able to like airtight seal our borders and prevent coronavirus from coming in. Um, but I wanted to ask you all, what would be different today in terms of our COVID-19 response if we did have a single payer healthcare system in place? And we can start with whoever. I, I'll say one thing, um, again, learning from Korea, uh, two things that are really important. Everyone um, needs to realize that Korea didn't close their borders. They didn't close their restaurants. They didn't even do um, sheltering. They uh, took an aggressive measure to test and identify people who were infected right away. They used uh, surveillance in the sense that they used cell phone records as well as credit card data to determine once you tested positive where you were in the last week. And they were able to match that to everyone that was in your immediate vicinity at the time when you were there. Now that is somewhat big, big brother-like, but to be honest, our big data companies are doing that every single minute of the day with us. But where I think a single payer system really differentiated itself is twofold. One is that if you started to have symptoms, um, you did not delay seeking care because you had a copay or deductible hanging over your head that precluded you from getting tested. Remember, the US Congress just passed uh, legislation that allowed, uh, mandated insurance companies waive their copays and deductibles for testing. Uh, but not for treatment, and that was only in the last two weeks. So if we go back and think that the first infections in the United States were sometime uh, in late January, um, uh, if you look at uh, from that period on, there were probably patients that had symptoms who uh, wanted to go get checked. One, we didn't have tests at that time, but even if, they, if we did have tests, would have delayed seeking care because they didn't have the $250 in their pocket for the copay and deductible. And as a result, I think they were continuing between that and not having sick leave, going into the workplace, infecting people, infecting um, uh, 
uh, coworkers, family members who then went around infecting other people unknowingly as well. I do think that if we, so I, I'm not saying that single payer by itself would have solved this because we didn't have the testing or mechanisms in place. If you look at Italy, uh, you know, part of their issue is not that they had a single payer system, but again, they were very much in denial about the risk and the spread of this disease, uh, unlike Korea that took aggressive policies from day one. Um, but I do think it would have greatly, uh, uh, if we had the testing in place as well as a single payer system, we would have greatly reduced the spread of this disease. I agree with everything Paul said. That's absolutely the case. I, you know, um, a functioning healthcare delivery system can only respond to a pandemic in um, conjunction with a functioning public health system. Um, and those, both of those things would have been necessary for, to, for us to have been able to respond optimally to this crisis. We have neither. Uh, so I think you know, when, when, the, when the history books are written, the United States will probably, unfortunately, go down in history as having the least functional, most dysfunctional, and sadly, probably most, um, uh, most deaths from this virus um, uh, of any country in the world. We've just surpassed um, China's death toll, and we're just getting started unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so first of all, we would have been much better prepared for this crisis in terms of the supplies that we needed. Um, uh, markets don't plan for pandemics. Um, they just don't. As somebody already pointed out, they're busy trying to, you know, uh, be as efficient as possible, eliminate redundancy, um, and that is exactly what you don't want to be doing if you want to have additional beds that you can call on and additional supplies and additional workforce in, in case of emergency like this. So we would have been much better prepared. Secondly, we would have had a much healthier population because our, our people would have had better access to better health care through the life cycle um, and had, had, had fewer uh, pre-existing conditions, which we're, we're learning from epidemiologic data, are very important to determining the severity of illness. Um, and so again, this, this whole story will come out as we learn um, more about the epidemiology, epidemiology of how this disease is playing out in the U.S. Um, we would have had uh, less siloed access to testing when it first became available. I told my students that when the first um, drive-through testing site was available in Berkeley, I called and found out that a, a sort of nonsensical number of certain insurances were accepted and other insurances weren't. And that meant that only a small subset of my patients could get tested there. From a public health perspective, it makes no sense to create access to testing for only certain people who happen to have certain insurance. When all people are in contact with each other, people aren't existing in any sort of social silos that relate to their insurance coverage. So providing testing or care to only certain subsets of the population, it, it makes no sense at all if you're trying to get your hands around a public health problem. Um, so these are just a few ways in which I could imagine having a um, single pair system even if our public health infrastructure wasn't much better, which I would have liked to, it to have been as well, as well, might have helped us in the, in the early stages of this epidemic. And then on the back end, all the people who are now losing their insurance because they're losing their job are going to form the, the beginning of another huge health crisis in the coming year plus. Um, people are going to stop being able to take their prescription medicines. They're not going to be able to go to their doctors and they're going to be, there's going to be a whole lot of cascade of other medical problems that will arise because people have lost insurance because of the economic crisis that we're in as well. That wouldn't happen if we had a single payer system in which people's insurance, health insurance, health care was not dependent on their employer employment status.
Dr. Shiram, did you want to comment or if not, we can move on to another question. Um, I mean, my only, you know, I, I obviously agree with everything that's been said so far. The only two quick things that I would add is that, um, and it's been alluded to earlier, is that the relationship between public health and the pharmaceutical biotech industry would be fundamentally different under a single payer system such that you would not have a situation where scattered profit-driven biotech firms would have no relationship to the you know to a central you know public health um, you know agency or authority that they would know exactly what their role is they would know who do I contact they would know like what their purpose would be in this in the case of a public health emergency simply because under a single payer system you would have established that relationship during times of calm that you know during times of calm like I mean a public health system knows you know just how much you know I mean antihypertensive medicine needs to be produced for its people it stays on top of that production you don't end up with the kinds of drug shortages that were happening on a day-to-day -day basis before a pandemic and so during a pandemic you would be able to figure out where shortages were because shortages do happen with you know in terms of beds the number of ventilators but you would be so aware of what those shortages look like where they were and how to plug the gaps in as opposed to now it's a lot of scattering and it's a lot of every now and then somebody raises their hand and says hey i've been making a ton of money off of this like one medical idea and i've been kind of selling it to the highest bidder but never really paying attention to who has the highest need and yeah, I guess I could help out now for a little while. None of that is, is the case with a single payer system. Um, also, you know, coming back to you know, helping the most vulnerable populations, there's a lot that we don't know about what the sequelae of COVID-19 is going to be. We don't know if we're looking at an entire new uh, demographic of disabled people whose lung capacity and ability to do physical work that they were doing before is now diminished because of having had this episode of illness. And because of that, as you know, we're going to, you know, they're going to have a harder time participating in the economy, like gonna have a harder time accessing that healthcare. Because right now the insurance industry is just waiting for open enrollment to come around, hike up everyone's premiums and say, you didn't really think all that stuff was free, right? You didn't really think that we were going to waive, you know, co-pays for testing and treatment forever, right? Like, I mean, you know, and I think that it's, it's the worst episode of Scooby-Doo ever. Like, we know who these people are. We know who these villains are. It's not hard to unmask. Yeah, no, that, it's, it's amazing how, how this exposes the so many issues in our fractured system. Um, I'm looking at the time now and I'm wondering if, um, well, first, if the three panelists have any time to go over maybe by 10 minutes. Um, and if so, then maybe I'm thinking that maybe we should still open things up so that the audience has time to, to ask questions. Okay, looks like all three of you can say it's awesome. Great. Um, and I, would say, yeah, I could keep asking a million questions, but I think um, I would love to hear from our audience or other people from SNAP and see if there's any questions for any of our panelists. So again, thank you so much. And let's open up for Q&A. Can I say one thing while we're waiting on that? Sure. Um, so, you know, the state of California where we're all based, um, you know, many of us were fighting for single payer uh, last two years only to have uh, it get killed in the state assembly. And the argument that a lot of the incrementalists in our state were using is let's just expand Medicaid. Um, and I just want to point out that this is going to show how Medicaid is um, not going to solve the problems. For one, uh, Medicaid is underfunded. We have um, we rank 47th in the country in terms of reimbursement to physicians. So trying to find doctors who will see Medicaid patients is problematic. Secondly, um, now that a lot of people are losing their jobs and uh, transitioning from an employer-sponsored healthcare, many of them are gonna be placed onto Medicaid, which will further stress our system uh, and make it even harder for people to find care. 
Uh, and then the final thing is, for those people uh, you heard during the Democratic debate, we can't kick 100 million people off their employer-sponsored health care. Well, the reality is now you just had 4 million that have lost their employer-sponsored health care. And many of them are not going to be able to maintain through COBRA because they just don't have the paycheck to, to go buy uh, their coverage. Uh, so that's another fallacy that exists. And then for those, the rest of us that have employer sponsored health care, um, you just saw the private insurance industry say that they're probably going to have to raise premiums 40% next year for everyone in order to handle the cost of COVID. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we all had a Medicare for all? We wouldn't have to worry about a 40% increase in our premiums next year. We wouldn't have to worry about health care if we lost our jobs. And we certainly wouldn't have to worry about finding a doctor to take our coverage uh, for those that have uh, Medi-Cal in the state of California. So in every way that the incrementalists in our state push for Medicaid uh, expansion, this is just highlighting how wrong they really were. Yeah, thank you for that, Paul. Um, so we have a question here from Amelia. Um, which is definitely an important question right now. So it's in this moment, what do you think are the most productive types of advocacy actions that we should be taking? Calling legislators, raising public awareness, et cetera. And I think Haruna's addition uh, to that question is important mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, balancing the, and recognizing the need that there is a lot of other focus for people right now in terms of, just getting food and, and paychecks, immediate needs. So how to balance kind of that more theoretical or um, long-term type of thinking with immediate needs and supporting people. So, um, uh, you know, I'll take a crack at um, fielding that question first. Um, you know, I would, I think that it's important to connect with people where their pain is at in the current moment. I don't think that we get anywhere by overlooking or sidestepping or um, avoiding converse, frank conversations about people's current pain and acknowledging, um, even just acknowledging that, that hurt and um, that struggle is important. And I think, you know, and then the next part of that is to actually connect to what is working right now, whether that is um, something like an initiative I'm doing now with uh, masksforamerica.org. It's um, we're doing fundraising to um, get 2 million masks to uh, frontline healthcare workers. Um, we've already shipped 12,000 and, you know, um, we're, you know, we keep working on that. Um, and a lot of the people who started this project are Medicare for all people, but, you know, and we all kind of know that we're in this mess because we didn't have a single payer system, but that isn't our opening, you know, like, um, argument for why we're doing what we're doing. We talk about the need for PPE and how that's a current pain that people are having. So I would say that there are a lot of different pains out there and to acknowledge them and to, you know, connect people's um, struggle with solution is um, is important for I think be, like earning people's trust and then to you know to also let people know that you are in with them for the long haul such that when um, you know problems do arise uh, in the future with like what Paul was saying about you know insurance companies hiking things up you know 40 percent when um, prescription drugs need to be paid for, letting them know that, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're going to, you know, figure out ways to um, get through all of that too. I think by proving ourselves trustworthy in our deeds and our words and our action, we end up like building the credibility that we need and the trust that we need to have conversations about Medicare for all. Um, but I don't think it can necessarily be the opener of our conversations. Can I just say, uh, piggyback one thing uh, that's really, I think, tangible. Um, Congress is, I guess, debating doing a uh, stimulus part four. And one of the things that we all should be advocating for is if you look at the sheer number of people that are gonna be infected and require hospitalization, 
I mean, it's staggering, right, uh, in terms of estimates, not even just including death, but just hospitalization and those requiring intensive care, um, either uh, prolonged hospitalization or requiring uh, being put on a ventilator. Uh, the amount of cost, out-of-pocket costs that they are going to have and be faced with uh, is, is, is crippling. So I've seen estimates that it's going to be anywhere from $20,000 to as much as $80,000 per patient that requires that intensive support. And even if you have really good insurance, remember, uh, the best insurance out there, I think, covers 80% of all expenses. Uh, and then for those that have these flimsy plans that only cover 60% and have a $6,800 to $7,000 deductible, that's enough to cause bankruptcy. So if we can bail out um, the airline industry, we should be all advocating right now that all of these um, medical bills that were uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be saddled with should be picked up by the federal government. Um, and then once we can advocate for that, real relief from these crippling medical bills, uh, the natural thing will be, well, why we wouldn't have all this if we had a Medicare for all. But I think in the short term, we all need to get up and, and advocate for that instead of all these bailouts that are going to big corporations. Yeah, I agree with what both of you have said. And, you know, I just would want to say respect to people who are making different choices about where to, where to where you're putting your energies right now there is so much to do there is lots of great ways to support communities and to advocate for necessary change um you know i think about hyper local needs immediate urgent needs for help and support um, as being a personal priority of mine paired with the uh, the high the sort of highest level systemic advocacy and i think of that really as as at the federal level if you, if you think about what caused the insurance companies to waive testing fees it was congress so I, I, you know, it, it's it's federal. It's it's the it's at the federal level that the biggest structural changes that can have the biggest effect um, uh, throughout the, co the country can happen. But meanwhile, um, frontline communities, uh, unhoused people, uh, incarcerated persons, um, poor the poorest communities in our local area are uh, suffering in so many ways, not just because they're at risk from this virus, but because they're cut off from, um, uh, from supports that they have come to depend on. Um, and uh, they're, uh, because their children are not going, our children are not going to school. Uh, there are so many needs right now for us to pull together and show solidarity and mutual support. Um, so I think there's just so many ways that um, any one individual can plug in and participate in, in, in great community and necessary community support work right now. Yeah, I'll add that we have so many folks at the JMP involved in awesome advocacy and action right now, especially, um, especially with our unhoused populations. And Haruna, you've been doing amazing work with that. So I just want to give a shout out to all of the people who've been really involved in advocacy and helping to um, protect our most vulnerable populations during this crisis. Um, we have a question from Camila. Um, I've been wondering how we can best stem the fear that the government would choose to get to choose who lives and dies under single payer, especially, I guess, in light of COVID-19 and deciding who gets uh, ventilator access and who doesn't. Um. You know, I'll, uh, I would argue that, you know, we already have uh, corporate structures determining who lives and who dies. Um, you know, I mean, I think right now who lives and who dies is determined by, you know, dollars. And, you know, I mean, a lot of, uh, and if you are not able to make a business case for, um, you know, patients, no matter, even if they are relatively affordable to take care of like they don't necessarily cost the system a whole lot if the business case is simply not measuring up to what shareholders need to see in a quarterly report um people are dying because of those uh of those estimations and i would argue that you know the fact that 
59% of America's uninsured are people of color is not an accident. That is, those are deliberate policy choices made publicly and privately that have abandoned people. And I think what Medicare for All ends up doing is uh, resetting a lot of our priorities, but it by itself is not going to be enough. Like it will still require advocacy from groups like this to remind you know, a single payer system hey, how do we take care of newly discovered, you know, I mean, categories of illness? Um, as, you know, we're able to add years of life onto conditions that were previously thought terminal, um, there are going to be some t challenging conversations about, you know, how much is worth paying for and all of that. Um, you know, right now, you know, I think the disability community has taught us a lot about how they have uh, wrangled with uh, the most difficult in the public sector, in the private sector, and have managed to, you know, eke out a threadbare uh, situation, especially like in the moms of uh, disabled kids, when you, when you listen to them talk about how they're able to secure, uh, for, you know, uh, treatments for things like hemophilia or for other rare um, childhood diseases, it's because they have been these advocates against all kinds of different public and private systems. And so we would want a Medicare for all system to listen to those families and adhere to the best of the of the standards that they've built, not just go for the average. Um, and so I think, but I do think that such a system would be far more responsive to the public um, and we know this only because of our, you know, of the histories of other countries. And I defer to my other, you know, fellow panelists to speak more about international comparisons. But, um, you know, there's a reason why nobody has abandoned NHS in the UK for 60 something years. Um, you know, there's a reason why Taiwan uh, opted for, you know, building single payer, um, you know, almost uh, 30 years ago, as opposed to going the way that they had been going. Um, and I think that, you know, Medicare for all is not going to be challenge free, but it's going to be much more responsive to um, political will um, than our current system is. I, I'm, I'm always amazed as a clinician, having practiced in our healthcare system for almost 20 years, I'm always amazed when, I shouldn't be at this point, when people who don't have experience within the system are shocked to hear about something that seems unfair or unjust to them. Because in fact, our healthcare system, the way it's organized, the way healthcare is delivered, um, is rife with injustice, is rife with unfairness. In spite of the daily efforts and good intentions of many good people working within it, nurses and doctors and healthcare practitioners, the system itself is already set up in ways that are unfair and unjust to so many people. Um, and that is a legacy of racism. It is a legacy of poor planning. It is a legacy of, of uh, incoherence. Um, it, is a leg it, is, it, is the, it is the fact that profit has been allowed to, say, to take the center stage in a system that really should be about to providing care to people. Um, so the fact that people are worried about how uh, care may be rationed at this one moment is just a tiny little example, one tiny example of so many moments that happen all the time when people who need care are unable to get it because uh, there aren't resources, because they don't have the right insurance, because there isn't enough resources in their area, whatever the reason might be. All of these things predated this, this crisis and unfortunately will still be there after it's over and we have to not not lose sight of that. Some of the forces that went into um, creating the injustice inherent in our system today are active right now in this in this crisis. And I'm thinking about racism. A lot of the xenophobia and racism that's active in the discourse about COVID-19 um, is some of the same kind of racist discourse that actually is part of the reason that we don't have a national health care program. 
we are the only industrialized nation that doesn't have a healthcare, a nationalized healthcare program. And rather than asking, well, why does Taiwan and why does the UK and why does South Korea, one might ask, well, why don't we? And unfortunately, part of that answer has to do with the legacy and history and active continuation of racism in this country for so many reasons. Um, and uh, that is something we need to confront um, as a medical community and as a society. And as we think about also designing a truly inclusive and equitable healthcare system that provides coverage for all, we need to attend to the ways that our care actually is, does not live up to our, our intentions of being equitable. And we need to look at the ways in which racism is actually present in our care delivery systems as well. So these are aspirations for all of us. It's a long-winded answer to that provocative question about care rationing, which is just to say that, yes, unfortunately, there are all kinds of ways that injustice is happening in our system. And we need to look at all of them um, as we think about how we can and must do a better job for all of our people. So unfortunately for the sake of time, I actually have another meeting I'm gonna to need to get to soon. But before we end things, I just really quickly want to hear from all three of you, if there's any kind of last thoughts you wanna leave us with. Um, this was such an excellent discussion and panel, even considering everything. Um, so um, again, yeah, any, any last thoughts you'd like to share with us? I would just like to say that uh, this coronavirus situation is really showing that we're all in this together one way or another, and each of our health is really linked. So if you look at your protect, perhaps you have somebody who is undocumented who is doing some work in your home, or you have somebody who is caring for your uh, kids or your elderly parent, many of them, if they do not have access to health care, uh, either because of an undocumented status or because of their socioeconomic condition, which prohibits them from having health care, um, th and they get sick, they will infect somebody in your family, and this will ultimately lead to an unhealthier society in general. You cannot keep their health uh, situation siloed just to their uh, population that you want to discriminate against. So this is something that is really gonna highlight the more that we as a society keep everyone together healthy, the healthier we all will be. And this uh, pandemic, I think, will illustrate this in ways that no other situation could ever do that. Um. You know, I guess uh, one of the one of the things that I like to remind people about because I get this question often about, you know, how do you talk to, um, how do you not just preach to the choir? How do you like, you know, go beyond these circles to, you know, grow the movement and expand, um, and talk to people who might even be, you know, they might have voted completely differently than, you know, anybody on this call, and what I like to remind people is that. You know, and we're seeing this now with COVID-19. COVID-19 doesn't check, you know, what your voting preferences were. Doesn't really check what you, you know, where you got your news. Um, it's, you know, I mean, it it really doesn't care about any of that. But I think that that is actually true of so many of the conditions of the illnesses that we take care of. That, you know, no, I mean, you know. Um, diabetes doesn't means test before it afflicts someone. It doesn't check that you can afford the insulin and won't be rationing it before, you know, I mean, you, it, it hits you, it just hits you. And all of these, you know, things that we take care of, um, you know, they, they are there to take us down. And, you know, I, I think, especially as students in healthcare, you know, you learn a ton about science and all the different treatments and all the things that we use to take care of illness. But our number one way of treating things that has not changed in the thousands of years of humanity is solidarity. We are the, you know, like to be a healer is to say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying with you, through, you know, and we're going to see this thing through. And I think communicating that value that, you know, that Medicare for all is about upholding that, living that value, turning it into something tangible 
is um, is a big part of what brings people like us to this movement. And I think it's also a big part of how we can start new conversations with people who are maybe not as familiar with or comfortable with or have had, you know, who are just, you know, struggling with getting, you know, their minds and hearts around um, single payer. And I think that by reminding them of our own personal values of, of being healers, that we actually can build some of these bridges so that um, the Medicare is really truly for all of us um, in ways that I think, you know, brought many of us to this profession to begin with. Okay. Well, thank you all so, so, so much. Um, I'm sorry again for the disruption at the beginning, but I still think we managed to turn this into a really engaging and informative panel. And yeah, as you said, Dr. Sriram, solidarity feels even more important during a time like this. Um, so again, thank you so much. Uh, last thing I'll say, Amelia posted in the chat, we have a website for our SNAP uh, group. Uh, which is jmp-snap.org. So I highly encourage you all to check it out, whoever's watching this video. And yes, thank you all so much to our three panelists and to Bradley. And yeah, I'll stick around for another minute as people head out. <laughs>